Praise the Lord. Rise up to prepare our hearts for the message. Let's rise up together as we pray. That the Lord will give you the heart of a real believer. The attitude of a real believer. Hearing the word of God as the word of God. Responding to that word. As children of God ought to respond. Yielding your heart in obedience. To that word of God that we hear. That the profit and the benefit of the word. Will be seen in your life. Not only in this retreat, but after the retreat, open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. So the word will have the right place in your heart. And you exalt the spirit. That inspired the word. So that in its influential power. It will touch your heart. Turn you around. Lead you. The way of life everlasting. Pray that God will give you the heart of a little child. Because the Lord said, except you receive the word of the kingdom. Like a little child. You will in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. So pray that God will give you that heart of a real child accepting the word, believing the word, resting in assurance of the promise of the word. You'll give the word the rightful place in your heart. Above your thoughts. Above the opinions of men. And above our preconceived ideas. Pray that the prevailing power of prayer you learn. Put in practice. So you become a prayer warrior, mighty, effective. You'll be like men and women of old that solved all their problems on their knees praying. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, our Father, we do thank you and worship you. We bless your name for bringing us together for this wonderful and unique retreat. Power for our hour. I will pray, Lord, the power that resides in the world. You bring to every heart, every life tonight, 
in Jesus name where we failed before will succeed now where we were defeated before we're going to have dominion in Jesus name and where the enemy has cheated us in our spiritual lives Lord we pray we recover everything we have lost in Jesus name help everyone Lord to rediscover the prevailing prayer power of importunate prayer speak to every heart Lord Lord we pray everyone will receive the word as the word coming from the throne of God and the word will do good in every life thank you Lord because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray Amen. thank you very much you can be seated we're looking at Luke chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 5 all through to verse 8 Luke chapter 11 verse 5 and he said unto them which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him friend lend me three loaves for a friend of mine in his journey is come to me and I have nothing to search before him and he from within shall answer and say trouble me not the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed I cannot rise and give thee I say unto you though he will not rise and give him because he is his friend yet because of his importunity yet because of his importunity asking and asking praying and praying making requests over and over yet because of his importunity he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. and I say unto you ask and it shall be given you seek you shall find knock and it shall be opened unto you the Lord Jesus Christ taught his disciples how to pray and to pray with importunity to ask over and over and over and over again until we receive and the Lord himself there in verse 8 mentioned the word importunity that's how we're talking about importunate prayer praying asking making requests over and over until the answer is granted Psalm 65 I'm reading from verse 2 Psalm 65 verse 2 O thou that hearest prayer unto thee shall all flesh come prayer is a common practice among the people that believe in God because we have assurance that God answers prayer and we who are the Christian fold who have the promises of God we in the Christian fold who know the characteristics of God the attributes of God the nature of God that is a faithful God a covenant keeping God a God that has the ability to do what he has promised to do and he never fails never forgets his own we of the Christian faith who are born again 
who know the Lord will see that he has fulfilled some of his promises already in our lives. And because of that, we have a greater assurance, a deeper assurance that he will answer our prayers. That's why it says, O oh, thou that hearest prayer unto thee, shall all flesh come. We're coming back to Luke chapter 18. Still emphasizing from the Lord Jesus Christ, importunity in prayer, asking, making requests, demanding, crying to the Lord over and over and over again. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 1, and he spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not to faint not to get tired not to give up not to give in to their discouragements ought always to pray whatever the challenge ought always to pray Whatever the demand upon your life, ought always to pray. Whatever arrows and darts the devil of the world may be throwing at you, there is a God in heaven who answers prayer, who works miracles, who solves problems, who makes impossibilities possible. And therefore, men ought always to pray. And not to faint, saying, There was in the city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto the judge unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. This is why importunity is necessary. This is why we shouldn't faint. This is why we never get tired. This is why we don't give up. This is why we don't easily give in to the discouragement of the enemy. He would not for a while, but afterwards, he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man. What a character. Though I fear not God, a real unbeliever, a real sinner, hardened sinner, fearing neither God nor regarding man. Yet, because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her less by a continual coming. That's the opportunity. Continual coming. Asking and asking again. Praying and praying again. Making requests and making it over and over again. Making your need known over and over again. It says, Lest by a continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge says, I shall not God avenge his only let, which cry day and night unto him, that's opportunity. Crying unto the Lord day and night, praying unto the Lord day and night, making requests day and night, making your need known unto the Lord day and night. And he said, though he be along with them, I tell you that he will avenge speedily. Tonight, God is going to answer our prayer speedily. And then it says, nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? The Lord said, near the time of his coming, men and women are going to abandon faith. They're going to abandon prayer. They're going to give up importunity. They're going to give up 
this great weapon of solving problems in life when the son of man cometh shall he find faith in your heart shall he find faith in this church shall he find faith on the earth importunity the prevailing power of importunate prayer genesis chapter 32 genesis chapter 32 i'm reading from verse 24 and jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day this praying this making request all through the night until the breaking of the day and when he saw that he prevailed not against him he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him and he said let me go for the day breaketh and he said and jacob said i will not let thee go except thou bless me jacob had a 20 year old problem with esau and esau was after his life and there was no place and there was no way jacob could turn to the left or to the right and there was no friend or contact or family member that could appeal to esau not a father not a mother will be able to appeal to Esau to solve the problem and end the animosity and the hatred and the enmity. And there was no friend, there was no peacemaker, somebody to go in between that will solve the problem between Esau and Jacob. And when all roads are closed, when all possibilities are totally gone, we still have a possibility up in the sky, up in heaven. And that is God. And Jacob realized that. And because of that, that's the reason why Jacob took this great privilege. The privilege of importunate prayer. And he prayed and prayed and prayed. Wrestling with this guest from heaven. And then it says, the angel said, let me go. Enough is enough. Because the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let you go. Except thou bless me. That's the attitude the Lord wants you to have tonight. Not only tonight in this retreat. Not only in this retreat in your life for the rest of your life. When you have a need. When you have a pressure, when you have a challenge, when you have a request, when you have a difficulty, when you have an adversary, when you have an enemy, when you have a spiritual need in your life that has been there for so many years, and then you take to prayer because you know. There's no human help anywhere that will be able to bail you out of the problem. And then you say, I'll pray. You know, there is a God in heaven that answers prayer, that can take this problem away. And there you come with that same attitude, that same heart, that same disposition. That same determination. And you say, I will not let you go until you change him, Esau, and change me, Jacob. I will not let you go until you converge him. I will not let you go until you save me. I will not let you go until you heal me. I will not let you go until you deliver me. 
I will not let you go until you sanctify me. I will not let you go until you strengthen me. I will not let you go until you baptize me, empower me, energize me, and I have the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. I will not let you go until you answer my prayer, until you guide me to the right choice in my life. I will not let you go until you renew me, until you revive me. Importunate prayer. There's power. When you hold onto the house of the altar and say, I will not give up. I'm not going to give the enemy a chance to win in the battle. I'm going to hold on and pray on until the answer comes. And the answer will come in Jesus' name. You look at this, it says in verse 27, And he said unto him, What's, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, thou hast as thou power with God and with men, and as prevail. You have power, you have prevailed. You have power, you have prevailed. You have power, you have prevailed. That's prevailing prayer of prevailing power, rather, prevailing power of importunate praying. Hosea chapter 12. Hosea chapter 12. Verses 3 and 4. Hosea chapter 12. Verses 3 and 4. He took his brother by the heel in the womb. And by his strength, he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept, he made supplication unto him. That's prayer. That's prayer. That is prayer. He made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel. And there he, Jacob, spake with us. He's talking to us about prevailing prayer, about prevailing power, and about importunate praying. He did it, we will do it. I said we will do it. He got the blessing, and we're going to get the blessing in Jesus' name. Prevailing power of importunate prayer, three points we're going to consider. Number one, the remedy. The remedy. Number two, the readiness. Ready to pray. Ready to hold on. Ready to pray and pray and pray over again. Readiness. Number three, reward. Number one, remedy through unrelenting, importunate prayer. Not giving up, unrelenting. Unrelenting, importunate prayer. Remedy through unrelenting, importunate prayer. Number two, readiness for unfailing, importunate prayer. Kind of prayer that never fails. A kind of prayer that hits the target. A kind of prayer that gets the answer on failing. Readiness. You need to get ready for that. Readiness for failing importunate prayer. Number three. The reward of unyielding, unbending, unwavering importunate prayer. You ask, ask again. You demand demand again you make a request make it again the reward of unyielding importunate prayer number one the remedy through unrelenting importunate prayer we find importunate prayer first mentioned in practice in genesis chapter 18 Genesis chapter 18. Here is where Almighty God Himself had appeared unto Abraham. And then He gave him a particular word that stuck with him. And when He did came to make use of that word, He went to God in prayer with importunity. 
Genesis chapter 18 verse 14. Genesis 18 verse 14 is there. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? When you hear that, it becomes easy to pray. What an encouragement to pray when you just heard from the Lord Himself that there's nothing too hard for God to do. Whether it concerns a man, a single man, or a family, a single family, or a nation, a whole nation, is anything too hard for the Lord? Now we come to verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure, there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? The Lord had just given information to Abraham and he has said Sodom is rotten filled with iniquity and I'm going there to see and when I see destruction is coming upon them their cup of iniquity is full and Abraham remembered that God had said that everything is possible with him and so he believed that deliverance and mercy and love compassion was possible even at this time and he approached the lord and he said will you destroy the city if you find 50 righteous people there in verse 25 that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous or the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be, that be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right was pleading for the mercy and the protection of God for Lot and his family and then for the old city there. And then the Lord said in verse 26, If I find a Sodom, pity righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. Abraham could have thought that would be prayer, ordinary prayer, normal prayer. But he continued, and this becomes importunate prayer. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. But adventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy all the city for the lack of five? And he said, if I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. Wonderful prayer. Importunity now, verse 29. And he spake unto him yet again, yet again, yet again. Importunity. How soon you give up. How easily you get tired. And then you just strike once and that is over. But Abraham went on and on because of importunity in prayer and he spake yet again and said but adventure there shall be forty found there and he said I will not do it for forty's sake and he said unto him oh let not the Lord be angry I will speak and I will speak but adventure there shall thirty be found there and he said, I will not do it if I find such there. And he said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure, there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. Importunity. Asking and asking. Making requests over and over again. Praying and praying again, staying there, standing there, kneeling there, crying unto the Lord over and over on that same request. And then it says in verse 32, and it said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once, but adventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way. 
As soon as he had left communion, communion with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. That's the first example of importunate prayer that you'll we'll see. Praying for a whole city. A sinful city. A wicked city. A defiled city. An immoral city. That God will have mercy. That God will not destroy. We find another importunate prayer in First Samuel chapter 1. Here is a personal need in a family. And even though the man, the husband, was not a praying man, and the family did not appear to be a praying family, yet the woman singled out herself as a person that can take her need, her request, the need of herself and the husband unto the Lord in prayer, Importunate praying, chapter 1, verse 9. So Anna rose up after that eating in Shiloh, and after they had drunk, now Eli the priest sat upon his seat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul. And that's what leads to importunate prayer. You feel the need. Bites you within, stinks you within, painful in your heart, like a fire in your bone. And you say, How do I move on in life without settling this problem? This will crush me, this will destroy me. The reproach is unbearable, the pain is unbearable, and this hindrance is unbearable. This problem must be solved. If I don't conquer it, it will conquer me. It will crush me. It will destroy me. Once and for all, this must be done. That's what leads us to importunate prayer. And if you have alternatives, I'm not going to pray with importunity. If I don't get it by prayer, I'll get it any other way. You'll never pray with importunity. But when you are just bottled up, narrowed down to just this one choice, that science will not do this, doctors will not do this, men will not do this, women will not do this, the world will not do this, nobody can do this for you. And you know it's God and God alone that can solve the problem. That's what brings importunity in prayer. And she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed unto the Lord and wept soul. And she vouched a vow. And said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, affliction, stirring up within, affliction, great pain and pressure within, affliction, biting in a place, in a way that nobody else can tell except you. It's, that's what leads to importunate praying. That you get on your knees and say, Lord, this problem must go. And that's the reason why in a retreat like this, there are some young people, what do they know about prayer? What do they know about pain? What do they know about problem? What do they know about need? They might just pray a few minutes and they are gone. Like all the other people that came to Shiloh, they are gone. Even the, even the husband of Anna, Elkanah, he was gone. Penina, she was gone. But the one that felt the need. Those are the people that have importunate praying. When you feel the need, when you see the need. And then you say, there's only one way. This problem can be solved. Then you take it to the Lord in prayer. And tonight, God will answer you. And then you, you, you support it with vow. You'll give anything. You'll give anything just to have that prayer answered. That's praying. When you say there's nothing too great, I'll give time. I'll give my energy. I'll give my knees. I'll kneel down. I'll give my strength. I'll stand up until I get tired, until I want to fall down. I'm going to pray and pray it through. She vouched a vow and said, Oh Lord, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, 
but will give unto me of the ten amid a man child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life. And there shall no razor come upon his head. Verse 27. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition which I asked of him. He will give you the petition. She prayed with importunity. The answer came. The answer will come. I said the answer will come. Ezekiel chapter 36. Ezekiel chapter 36. What did in there from verse? I'm going to choose some verses there. Verse 9. When you have a promise and you have been holding on to that promise for some time. And you have waited and waited and waited. And the promise is great. The promise is sublime. The promise is super. The promise is extraordinary. But it has not come. That's what leads to opportunity praying. That how can I miss a promise like this if I'm not careful? This promise will slip by me all through my life. Now is the time to get it. You will get it. Look at the promises where you say, I will. I will. God saying, I will. That's what to take to the Lord in importunate prayer. Ezekiel 36 verse 9. For behold, I am for you. The Lord is for you. I will turn unto you, and ye shall be tilled and sown. When you think about such a promise, and the Lord says, I am for you. And the enemies look nearer than the Lord. And the poverty looks nearer than the Lord. And your need looks nearer than the Lord. And the sickness, the affliction looks nearer than the Lord. And yet the Lord had said, I am for you. Then you know it is time for importunate prayer. Verse 11. I will multiply upon you man and beast. And they shall increase and bring forth. I will settle you after your old estates. I will do better unto you than at your beginnings. Is that all the amen you can give? Better, better days have come. I will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. That's what causes importunate praying. When the Lord said, I'll do better unto you. And all you can see around is something worse than yesterday. Something more terrible than yesteryears. Something that is down in the beach. In the lowest valley. Rather than on the highest mountain. That's why you say, if I'm not careful, the better things will never come. That's what takes you to your knees. That's why you say, Lord, this is the time the time of the better things that's what leads you to importunate praying look at verse 24 verse 24 it says in 24 for i will take you from your from among you, the heathen and gather you out of all the countries I will bring you into your own land. And when you look at yourself and say, Lord, look at what you promised me. What else do I need to do? Why is it not done? When you say you'll take me to my own land, I'm still living in a borrowed place, wearing borrowed dresses, living in a borrowed apartment. And just in a place I cannot even call my own. And you said, you'll take me to my own land. And I'm not seeing it. And that's why those who have importunate prayer, they're very thoughtful. They sit down and they think. They're not the people that just rush on and rush on and rush on in life. And they don't have any time to think about their lives. 
and they're busy helping other people they're not helping themselves and Jacob said Laban I've been here laboring and working for you when am I going to build my own family and build my own house when am I going to cater for myself when am I going to show my love that love to myself love your neighbor as yourself I've been loving my neighbors I don't seem to show any love to myself I'm laboring, I'm laboring for other people, I'm building what belongs to other people. I'm not building myself. I'm not claiming the promise of God for myself. That's what leads to importunate praying. Verse 25. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. When you have waited for that for a long time. And then you find that there are still some things that are attached to your life, affiliated to your life, associated with your life. And say, I'm ashamed to confess this. I'm ashamed to reveal this. And God said, it will cleanse me. It will wash me. It will purge me. And I will be clean. I'm ashamed to tell of the defilement I feel within. That's what leads to importunate prayer. Verse 26. A new heart also will I give you. That's what leads to importunate prayer. When you see that your heart is not different from that of your daddy, from that of your mommy. That mommy and daddy used to get angry a lot, fighting one another. And you see that that same heart is what you have. And say, Lord, I'm born again. I'm a child of God. And this kind of heart that rejoices in the downfall of other people. This kind of heart that rejoices when other people are sorrowful. This kind of heart that has a glee, a smile, grinning, smiling, laughing, happy. When other people are down, I don't like it. What kind of heart is this? Lord, what you promised me, I'll give you a new heart different from that of the community and different from that of the people that are rampaging and destroying other people i don't feel any pinch in their conscience lord i need this fulfill your promise this is what leads to importunate prayer when you examine yourself and you see the promise the lord has given and it's not being fulfilled in your life a new heart also will i give you and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. It will come. Verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you. And cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. That's what leads to importunate prayer. I will put my spirit within you. When you see the people that just came last retreat, they got born again last year. Now they are saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, having anointing, unction, power, sensitivity to the Spirit of God. And you are there. And you've been here for many years. And you are dry. And the only thing you have is the scriptures that you have learned. In the mind in the head and you know that your life is weak and dry and it doesn't have the refreshing the auction the anointing of the holy ghost that's what leads to importunate prayer as you look at the promise of god and say lord the time has come i must be serious if i continue like this just pray that two minute prayer five minute prayer and i'm gone like i always do if I'm not careful until I die, I may not receive this from his power, anointing, refreshing, in feeling, in dwelling, baptism in the Holy Ghost. That's what leads to importunate prayer. And then he tells us in verse 29. In verse 29, and I will save you from all your cleanness. And I will call for the corn and will increase it. And lay no farming upon you. When you look at your surrounding, then you see that you're living from hand to mouth. And then you're so worried about food. You're thinking so much about food. You know, the people that have food, plenty and surplus, they don't think about food. You only think about what you don't have. The people that have clothes, 
more than they can wear. They don't think about clothes. You don't think about what you don't have. The people that have a wife, don't think about a wife. They are, have their wife already. You don't think about what you don't have. The people that have children, they don't think about children. You don't think about what you have. You don't think about children when you don't have one. And when you see the promise of God, here is what the Lord has promised you. And one way or the other, something is happening that you are missing. That which the Lord has given. And then you say, Lord, what's the matter? And I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, quite a lot of a lot of us who are here, you know, the one pastor was talking to me, the other said, Pastor, when are we going to have a single seminar? I said, single seminar? What are you talking about? I said, now get serious. What are you talking about? Single seminar. And who is to handle the single seminar? He said, you know, uh, you know, Pastor, we're just thinking, we call all these young people, we collect them together, and you come to give them single seminar and release everybody that they, get, they can get married. And I said, why didn't you say that last year? Now you say that today when I'm single myself. Who is going to give single seminar? Praise the Lord. And then I, I'm thinking about it and I say, all these thousands of women and ladies and born again people who are here. And these single people don't have anybody to get married to. With all these thousands of people, something is wrong. That thing we're going to correct it. I said we're going to correct it. I think the camp commandant should mark it down and, you know, remind me that I need to give a single seminar. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. That is whether I'm single or married myself, that doesn't matter, I'm still going to do it. After all, before I got married, you know, 1980, I used to preach on marriage and, you know, get people to know the will of God. And I'm going to do that all the same. And by the way, those of you who are single, men, women, where are you? Can you stand up? Just, 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 to, where are you? Don't just wave your hands. Stand up. Where are you? Hello? Camera, help me catch them. Praise the Lord. I'll soon get back to you. I said, I'll soon get back to you. Is that all right? If that's all right, I can't see any sign. Praise the Lord. And then those, you can see that now. I just wanted to see your face. Praise the Lord. And then the rest of us, those who are married and you are looking for something, that's something you are going to get. The point is this. With so much water in the river, we're thirsty, there's no water to drink. With so much food, and so much fruit, we're hungry, and there's no food to eat. And I'm saying, why? With all the provision of God, and with all the possibilities available and yet we're not able to find what god has promised us that's what brings opportunity in prayer that's why now we read in verse 37 thus says the lord i will yet for this be inquired of by the house of israel to do it for them I will yet for this be quiet. He said, I will. I will. I will. A number of times. And then after the end of I will, I will, I will. He then says, You must pray. That's what brings importunity in prayer. You will pray with importunity, and God will answer in Jesus' name. Number two, now readiness. For unfailing, importunate prayer. How do we get ready? Somebody might be there saying, Pastor, I've been praying. I prayed all my heart out. I prayed kneeling. I prayed standing. I prayed in the day. I prayed in the night. 
What do I still need to do? Because I prayed with importunity. And yet, I've not got what I'm looking for. Well, you need to get ready. Because it's the readiness that brings the answer to the prayer. Psalm 66, verse 18. Psalm 66, verse 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We need to get ready and get trade, get rid of that iniquity. Confess it, forsake it, abandon it, be free from it. Because if I regard iniquity, sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Job chapter 22, iniquity. Job chapter 22, verse 23. If thou return to the Almighty, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity far from thy tabernacles. Readiness. You get rid of iniquity. Then, verse 27, thou shalt make thy prayer unto him. And he shall hear thee, and thou shalt pay thy vows. Thou shalt also decree a sin, and it shall be established unto thee. And the light shall shine upon thy ways. Iniquity is the problem. Get rid of it, and then you are going to have the answer to your prayers in Jesus' name. Chapter 34 of Job. Job 34 verse 32 That which I see not Teach thou me If I have done iniquity I will do no more You see what the Lord is saying Is how to get ready So that the Lord can answer Your prayer It says That which I see not If you have been practicing iniquity Without knowing it's iniquity Living in sin, without even feeling any conscience for it. Without knowing it is sinful. And then you just feel everybody is holy. That's what Korah, Dathan, and Abiram said. All the congregation is holy, I'm holy. I'm righteous, I'm saved, I'm sanctified, I'm pure. I'm ready for the rapture. And then there's iniquity. And you pray and pray, and God has not answered. It says, that which I see not, something I'm not looking at, something I am not thinking about. And the Lord says, it's iniquity, teach thou me, if I've done iniquity, I will do no more. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 1. This is what hinders prayer. And if we're going to pray powerful, prevailing prayer with importunity, and with success and victory, we need to get rid of that iniquity of that sin and become holy, righteous, saintly, purified, sanctified. In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 4, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, that's the problem. That's why people pray and pray and pray and there is no answer. A people laden with iniquity, seed of evil doers, children that are corrupters. And that are forsaking the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Look at verse 15. And when ye spread your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When ye make many prayers, I will not hear your hands are full of blood because of iniquity. To get ready to pray on failing. Importunate prayer, we get rid of sin. We get rid of sinning. Get rid of unrighteousness. Get rid of evil. Get rid of defilement. Because except the iniquity is gone, taken away, except there is cleansing, righteousness. Holiness, purity of heart and life. The Lord will say, when you make many prayers, I will not hear because your life is full of iniquity. Isaiah chapter 59. 
Isaiah 59. I'm reading from verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save. Neither is ear heavy, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities, you see that? It's a sin. It's unrighteousness. It's an evil. The iniquities. But your iniquities are separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid the face from you that he will not hear. If we're going to get ready to pray importunate prayer, we must take away that sin. Secret adultery. Secret fornication. And that secret and covered up stealing. And that covetousness. That hatred, animosity and evil. That defilement. The worldliness that will hide away from the church. And yet it's there. We must get rid of that. Because if we don't, the iniquities will hinder even importunate prayer from being answered. Ezekiel chapter 4, chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 1. Then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up the idols in their hearts and put the stumbling block of their iniquity. Iniquity. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. They have set their idols in their heart. It's in their heart. They may not wear it on the neck. It may not be on their head. It may not be in their appearance. It's in their heart. They are idols in their heart, and they put the stumbling block of the iniquity before my face, before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Should they pray? And should they have any kind of expectation that the prayer will be answered when they have the stumbling block of the iniquity before their face? Therefore speak unto them and say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in the heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and coming to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols that I may take the house of Israel in their heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your face or your faces from all your abominations. Let's have to get ready for importunate praying. Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 30. Ezekiel 18, verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity, that's the word again, iniquity, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So that iniquity shall not be your ring cast away from you. All your transgressions, everything, whereby ye have transgressed and make you in your heart and in your spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dies, says the Lord God. Wherefore turn yourselves and live ye. That's how to get ready. So that we can pray importunate prayer that is mighty, efficacious, and powerful. Second Timothy chapter two. Second Timothy chapter two, verse nineteen. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, 
And let everyone, everyone, everyone that nameth the name of Christ. That's what you do in prayer. We name the name of Christ. And when you pray with importunity, you name that name of Christ over and over and over again. And it says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Why? Because when you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. And if you're going to be ready for importunate praying, iniquity must go. It will go. And not an iota, a grain of iniquity. The least of all iniquities, not the least, will appear remain in your life in Jesus' name. The Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Verse 21, if a man therefore purge, purify, cleanse himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, purified, made holy, a sanctified vessel. Those are the people that are ready for importunate prayer. And they pray, prevailing, because they've gotten rid of outward sin and inward sin, public sin and private sin, occasional sin and besetting sin. If a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good or flee also youthful lust, flee fornication. Flee adultery, flee immorality, flee also youthful lust, and follow, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of what kind of heart? A pure heart. That's how to get ready for importunate prayer. What's the reward? I come to point number three, the reward of importunate prayer. We're looking at some two, praying, asking, demanding, making requests over and over and over again. The reward of unyielding, unwavering, importunate prayer. Some two verse eight, ask of me I keep asking ask and ask again demand and demand again make the request over and over cry unto the Lord over and over again ask of me and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession there are many people that are doing evangelism, reaching out, witnessing, soul winning. And they are telling us that the people are hard. The people are tall. The people are nowadays they don't want to listen. Because we don't pray. Because we are not importunate in our prayer. Because we are not asking and asking and asking and asking. Because we don't stay there asking until it is granted. And the Lord is saying, here is the reward of importunate prayer. Ask of me. And I shall give thee the pagans, the heathen, the idol worshippers, the hardened sinners. The incorrigible sinners, I give them to you because the hearts of all people, they're in the hands of the Lord to turn the hearts whithersoever He wills. And then it says, I'll give them for possession your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth. I give that for your possession. Well, ask. I said, We're going to ask. I said, We're going to ask. And the Lord will give unto us in Jesus' name. How about your daddy not born again yet? Ask, 
about mommy not born again yet ask about your grown up children they are slipping away from your hand they are leaving you they say, daddy go to your church we don't want to go mommy you can go we don't want to go it doesn't concern you ask that's what opportunity means and that is what to pray for essential important what shall it profit you if you gain all the money in the world and you lose your children to the devil to the world to hell ask with importunity asking that the lord will touch the souls turn around the souls and the hearts of your children so that they come to know the lord lamentation chapter 2 lamentation chapter 2 lamentation chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 18 arise cry out in the night in the beginning of the watches pour out thine heart like water before the face of the lord and lift up thy hands toward him for the life of your young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street then he tells that's verse that's verse 19 he says we cry aloud with importunity asking for these children i pray that our children will not be lost did i hear you say amen Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore also now says the Lord, Turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. That's the call of God to importunate prayer for the church. And he talks about number one, repentance from the heart, not repentance from the lips, from the mouth, from the head superficial on the surface repentance from the heart rent your heart and not your garments and turn unto the lord your god for he is gracious and merciful look at verse 15 blow the trumpet in zion sanctify it fast call a solemn assembly gather the people sanctify the congregation assemble the elders gather the children even let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet and let the priest and the minister of the lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say spare thy people O lord and give not thy heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them wherefore should they say among the people where is thy god importunate prayer number one repentance from the heart number two realization of humiliation realization of our humiliation look around you look at your life look at your family and look at the church and look at the church at large in the nation and look at how the unbelievers are grinding the face of the church in the mud. The reproach, the power, overbearing power of those unbelievers on the body of Christ, on the church. And it says, gather the people together. The priests, the people, the ministers, the members, cry unto the Lord. Come to realization of the humiliation. Verse 18 then will the lord be jealous for his land and pity his people he'll pity his people 
yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Did you say amen? amen. Verse 20. Verse 20. The Lord is calling the people together. And the Lord is saying, There is a need. There is a pain. That we cannot tell. Difficult to talk about. There is a challenge. For the body of Christ. For the church. And the Lord says, Let there be importunate praying. That begins with repentance from the heart. That comes with a realization of humiliation. And then, response from heaven. Response from heaven. We're going to pray. In our land, terrible things are happening. You know that? I said you know that. When you hear of unrest, when you hear of these killings, it's happened two times already this year in a particular stage in this nation. And it affects virtually everybody. I think it was just this week, I had to call one of our overseers over there in a place where the sea was terrible. One of our pastors there. He wasn't at home. And this terrible thing broke out. He had a wife and five children. The wife was killed. Four children were killed. And the only one child remaining was battered, terribly injured. The child is still in the hospital now. And because of these terrible things, or we can't talk about our church buildings that are burnt. And we cannot talk about other people that lost property, losing lives. But this single pastor in our church, four children gone, killed. The wife killed. That's why the Lord is saying, there must be importunity in prayer. I want to pray for just those little, little things that, you know, you can get that even without prayer. We're talking about important things. Verse 20 now. And I will remove far off from you the northern army. If you believe that, say Amen. The church should not be timid in prayer. In our house, in our own church, we should not cover our mouth to speak about our need. When we're being killed and we're dying, pastors losing wives, losing children, and the church losing church buildings, we cannot be so timid. And not look at the promise of God. The Lord said in verse 20, But I will remove far from you the northern army. Give me another amen. I will drive him into a land barren and desolate. With his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost sea and his sting shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great terrible things the lord is telling us that if we will come together with importunity in prayer starting with repentance from heaven 
A realization of our hum humiliation. Response from heaven. And then restoration of the harvest. Look at verse 21. Fear not, O land. Fear not, people of God. Be glad and rejoice. For the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field. For the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth a fruit. And the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion. And rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat. And fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore unto you the years the locusts have eaten. The, camp, the, the, cater, the canker worm, the caterpillar, the palmer worm, the great army which are sent among you. That is restoration of the harvest. If we can pray with importunity, it is coming. You will see it. You will enjoy it. You will be part of this coming revival in Jesus' name. Verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty. And be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God. That has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Importunate prayer shall take the reproach away. Importunate prayer shall take the humiliation away. Importunate prayer shall take all the shame away in Jesus' name. And ye, sh and ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and none else and my people shall never, never, never be ashamed. This is reassurance from the Most High. Reassurance from the Most High. We have the assurance that tonight as we're going to pray, thousands of us praying, in unity together, there's going to be victory. For you as an individual, victory. For your family, victory. For your local church, victory. And then for the church at large, there's going to be victory. For the body of Christ in this nation, there's going to be victory. Number one, Joel has been talking about repentance from the heart. Number two, Joel is talking about realization of our humiliation. Number three, Joel is talking about response from heaven. Number four, Joel is talking about restoration of the harvest. Number five, Joel is talking about reassurance from on high. Number six, refreshing in the Holy Spirit. Refreshing in the Holy Spirit. And it shall come to pass, verse 28, that afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see vision. Also upon my, my servants and my handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. There will be a refreshing of the Holy Spirit today. Number 7 now, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, shall be saved, shall be delivered, shall be healed. Regeneration for whosoever will. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered, shall be saved. Regeneration for whosoever will. The Lord is calling the church today to importunate prayer. And he wants us to know the power, prevailing prayer of that importunate prayer. And let's start with repentance, then realization, and then the response is coming from heaven. There's going to be 
see restoration. We have an assurance already that the Lord is going to win the victory for us. A refreshing will come even tonight and regeneration, renewal, rebirth for those who are not yet born again. The Lord is going to start now. I say the Lord is going to start now. We're going to rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Put everything down. Don't allow anything to hinder you and don't allow anything to a kind of a distract your attention. Here we're going to pray because the Lord says pray, pray. And the Lord says there is power, prevailing power in that importunate praying. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, Lord, save your people. Lord, look at the humiliation of your people. Lord, look at the problem, the trauma, the trouble over your people. Come, Lord, save your people. He will do it. Joel said, gather the people together. Joel said, well, the priests, or the ministers, or the bridegroom, or the bride, or the women, or the men, or the children, gather them together. Great problem upon the church. Great reproach upon the church. Great devastation and destruction upon the church. Great persecution over the church. Terrible happenings. From the unbelievers over the church. And the Lord is saying, get together, gather together. Let me fight the battle for you. Pray. So at this reproach from the heathen. Reproach from the heathen. The Lord will run it away. Killings, destructions, burnings, people doing evil with impunity, lawlessness. Taking over the land. Pray with importunity. This must not continue. Put your place in the put yourself in the place of those who have lost wives, lost children, lost property lost everything put yourself in their place feel the pain see the trauma and call upon the Lord don't be afraid to make your problem known publicly unto the Lord Are you going to be quiet till they kill everybody? Would you pray? Pout your heart, your soul, importunity in prayer, importunity in prayer. If you have relatives, brothers, sisters, a father, a mother, an uncle, in those areas, and it happens to one of yours, your heart will bleed. Since we cannot fight with human weapon, Aren't you going to fight with the weapon of importunate prayer? Part your heart, part your soul.
Will not unbelievers become afraid of being born again, being converted? When you see what is happening to those Christians? Will they not be running away from the church, from Christ? Not yielding themselves to the Lord to be born again? When they see what incessantly is coming up over and over against the church, and nobody seems to be doing anything, you can change the tide of evil. By prayer, importunate praying, importunate praying, importunate praying. But upon the Lord, pour out your soul and pour out your heart before the Almighty God. Lord, have mercy on your people. Give us the same protection as of old. The preservation as of old. Spare your people, Lord. Protect your people, Lord. Preserve your people, Lord. Remember your promise. Upon this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church importunate prayer Lord fulfill your promise manifest your power do what you have said you will do Break the backbone of the enemy. Importunate. Unceasing. Unstoppable praying. Tell the Lord. We cannot be here in thousands and thousands like this. And I'll not allow the church of Christ to be overrun with evil people. Let there be a repentance from the heart. And your hearts are not your garments. Let there be a realization of our humiliation. Churches burnt, what humiliation, what reproach. Ministers, pastors, priests killed, what humiliation, what reproach. The reproach of the heathen. Pray. That's power. Prevailing power in importunate praying. There will be a response from heaven. A response from heaven. A response from heaven. That's what you are waiting for. Pray until that response comes. Until the reproach of the heathen is driven away. Importunate prayer. 
until there's a restoration of the harvest the harvest of souls restoration 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 of the harvest until we forget our sorrows forget our heartaches until a renewal comes a reassurance from heaven the people of God will not be ashamed again tell the Lord to make bear his mighty hand and release his people from under this yoke of affliction so that the church of the living God in any part of this country will not be living on that threat some fear pray when there is peace in the land then there will be prosperity then you will enjoy the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living You must be concerned, you must touch your heart, if it touches your heart you will pray, if you are concerned you will pray with importunity. with earnestness thinking about the need of the church the need of the family of God importunity importunity in prayer Do away with lesser things. Get serious on this important thing. Pray, pray, pray with importunity. Pray and pray again. Call and call again. Cry and cry again. Plead. And plead again with the Almighty God. Importunity in prayer. Lord, visit the land. Break the yoke. Protect your church. Preserve your people. Shelter and shield your people importunity in prayer importunity in prayer ask and shall be given you. Seek, he shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. 